Welcome to FaithWorks, the enlightening and empowering program that builds your faith to help you overcome every single challenge in this life. My name is Kaude Adeshoga. I'm your host. I want you to sit back, listen, and be blessed. God bless you. Now this morning, um, I'm going back again to the subject of faith. We can't leave the subject of faith because like I said earlier, is still the most important subject on earth. Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, we cannot please God. Colossians 1, 16 says, we are created to please God. Revelation chapter 4 says, he has created all things for his pleasure. And the only way we can please him is that we walk by faith. In the book of Habakkuk, it said, the just shall live by faith. In Corinthians, it said, the just shall live by faith and not by sight. So it's a lifestyle a Christian cannot run away from. So you cannot get tired of hearing about faith every day. And as long as I have this opportunity, I'll continue to talk about faith till you walk by faith and your faith measures to the faith of God such that God can leave you to handle the earth as if he was there. And you will have the same result. Jesus said, the works I do, you should do an even greater. Meaning we're not even supposed to do what God did. We're supposed to surpass God in whatever he had done. And he did everything by faith. Hebrews 1 says, by faith, the earth and the heavens were made out of nothing that he made them by faith. Praise the Lord. So this morning we're looking at the basics of faith, an aspect of faith we ignore so much at so many times, and it's so important, and it's so crucial, and it's even, we call it the great confession. We are made Christians by confessing Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. And so today we're looking at faith in another perspective. I call it the basics of faith. Last week, we looked at faith and medicine, and I'm sure you were really blessed by that message. Today, we're looking at just the basics of faith. All the great names we have written in the Bible, from Noah, or even from Abel, Noah, Enoch, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and the list is endless. And it goes on and on. In Hebrews 11, it calls them the people who had a good report with God. And their names are written in gold. So God has a book of the names of people who pleased him, who have a good report with him. Some of them don't even have a good report with men. Some people use, for example, Samson on a negative note to preach. But the Bible says his name is written in the archives of God as having a good report with God. And these men... One thing is common to every single one of them. They had monumental crisis that was beyond their natural ability to solve. Every single one of them. And another thing about all of them, they faced the crisis and they solved their crisis and glorified God on the face of this earth. Now, crisis... If I look at, for example, James chapter 1, and I'm going to read James chapter 1 from verse 12. James chapter 1 from verse 12. James is in the New Testament. Um, James is in the New Testament. Now, it talks about trials, and it says, blessed is the man, blessed. Oh, I thought he was going to say, blessed is the man that gives to the Lord he says, that faces trials. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord had promised to them that love him. So what it means is an aspect of trial brings you blessings and rewards, both in this life and in the world to come. Wow. Then it goes further. Verse 13, let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. When lust has conceived, 
it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is matured, it brings forth death. Meaning, the trial will either bring death or the crown of life. Now, the way you respond to the crown, now the trial of its own cannot bring death. Neither can the trial of its own bring the crown of life. Your response to the trial, your response to the crisis you're facing, your response to the challenges you face in life is going to determine whether you will be blessed and have the crown of life or that person is going to end up in death. Now, Abraham had trials, but he was blessed from those trials. Noah had trials. He was blessed from those trials. Joseph had trials. Moses, they all had trials, but they came up blessed from those trials. I always say one thing, your level of faith is going to be determined in life by your response to the challenges confronting you in life. There was a time Jesus was in a boat. I'm trying to remember when the scripture was in a boat and he was asleep in the stern of the boat and there was a great storm and the storm hit the boat and was pushing water into the boat and it looked like they wanted to sink. And the disciples woke him up and said, Lord Jesus, don't you care that we perish? He woke up, calmed the storm and said, how come you have no faith at all? Their response to that crisis was fear and an accusation against God. How can you say God doesn't care you perish? God cares. He created you for glory. He created you for blessings. He cares. He doesn't want you to perish. Now, they accused him of not caring that they will perish. Now, they approached the crisis from a negative standpoint. And because of that, the Lord said they had no faith. Now we see people approach crisis from a positive position and the Lord commends their faith. And some of you have great faith and they say, oh, strong faith. Oh, blessed are you, blessed is this, blessed is this. So the crisis is not the situation, it's not the problem. Coronavirus is a crisis. In itself, it's not the crisis. Your approach and your response to it is going to determine what God is going to do in your life as regard the virus. And that's how it is applicable to every aspect of your life. No one is immune from crisis. In John 16, 33, Jesus said, In this world you will have tribulation. But he said, Be of good cheer, for I have what I have overcome the world. You cannot escape it. It is part of the operations of life. Everyone will face it at one time or the other. Say, I know a man who didn't face crisis. His name is Solomon. There was no crisis in his life. His name is not in the archives of those who have a good report with God. He may have a good report with him because he had a lot of money. But in the sight of God, he's not a force to be reckoned with. We can't recount any major crisis in his life. Amen. In James chapter 1 from verse 12, from verse, sorry, James, um, sorry. James chapter 1 from verse 2 to 8. It says, count it all joy when you find yourself in overwhelming challenges. Wow. He said, because the faith, maybe we should just go there. James chapter 1, I'll read from verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you find yourself in myriad of challenges. Sometimes it overwhelms you so much, you don't even know which one to start with. Knowing this, the trial of your faith worketh patience. Let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect, entire, lacking nothing. God says it will work patience. And then if in that crisis you don't know what to do, ask God for wisdom, who will give you liberally, and he will not upbraid you. Meaning, your first approach to crisis is to count it joy. Now, that's not our natural approach to crisis and challenges. Our first normal approach is either we blame somebody for it or we complain about this and that. I'm not exonerating the government, but we blame the government. I'm not exonerating the church. We blame men of God. I'm not exonerating maybe your parents. You blame, you blame everybody except yourself. And that's not a good way to approach crisis. The first thing God recommends is count it joy when you find yourself 
in crisis. Everyone loves comfort. Everybody wants it going easy. No issues at all. But life is not designed to function that way. And so Moses faced crisis at the Red Sea. Abraham faced crisis. Isaac did. Everybody did. And they overcame. And I pray for every crisis and challenge that is before you. The ultimate of it is that the name of the Lord will be glorified and you will be honored in the mighty name of Jesus. You will overcome it and you will get every reward attached to it. Do you know that that crown of life that the Lord said in James chapter 1 verse 12, do you know in this life we're going to face about 21 um, reward seats when we get to heaven? In Matthew 12, he says, every idle word will give account of it on the day of judgment. Meaning there is a seat we'll get to. They're going to play all the words you have spoken. And they'll ask you to start accounting for each one. If you spoke wrong words, the Bible says we'll suffer losses. The reward seat that you will get to, and they will ask in Malachi chapter 3. Most people just know Malachi for tithe and offering. No, there's so much in Malachi. He thought about those who fought on the Lord and spoke of the Lord and commune of his name. He says a book will be written and a memorial will be written. In Revelation 20, he says, and 20, 21, 22, he says on the day of judgment, the books will be opened and people will be rewarded. So all these things you do in life, they're going to fetch you eternal reward. Sometimes these crises are for eternal reward. Some are for earthly reward and some are for both earthly an eternal reward. Amen. Now, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 tells us that every crisis has a lifespan. It has a beginning. It has, has, it has an end. The coronavirus has a beginning. It's going to have an end. And when it ends, my prayer is that you'll be standing and your life will be bringing glory and honor to God in the mighty name of Jesus. Paul calls it light affliction. What he calls light affliction, he listed it. He said days in, in, in uh, three days on the sea. He said peril of robbers. He was chasing. He was beating. When he listed all the perils he went through, he calls it light affliction, which are bought for a moment, but worketh for us a far more exceeding weight of glory. So every crisis you are facing, if you will write it down, you write maybe seven, six, or ten. That means you have 10 weights of glory waiting for you to be blessed. Amen. Do you desire to live and operate God's way of doing things? Do you desire to understand how faith works? Fundamentals of Faith is a book written by Kayode Adishoga. It teaches in simple terms how to operate the God kind of faith that helps you overcome all hurdles of life. Fundamentals of Faith is available for purchase at Trem Bookshop Obani Koro Lagos and Bible Wonderland Stadium Surulere Lagos. Get a copy today. Now, um, I want us to look at what do we do in the face of this crisis? How can we be blessed before this crisis? What does God expect of us in this crisis so that he can release his power and be glorified in our midst. Now, if you are facing a crisis that does not have then you are most qualified in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says that, maybe I should read it again. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Here's Paul saying from verse 1. Sorry, 2 Corinthians ch yeah, chapter 12 from verse um, 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that was given to me, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, that I should, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I sought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ 
may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Meaning, the more the challenges, the more the grace of God that's resting on you. The greater the challenges, the greater the power of God that is resting on you. It says that because I didn't know how to get rid of this situation in my life, God told me, he said, my power is resting on you. My grace is made available for you. So those of you who are going through challenges that is overwhelming you, the first thing you must know is that the power of the Almighty is resting on you. Why? Because you are in a state of weakness. And his power rests in a state of weakness. That's why Paul said, when I am weak, then I know I'm strong. Why? His grace is made perfect in weakness. And we'll look at a few examples to buttress that. So the first thing I'm going to recommend for anyone that is facing crisis is that you must first change your mindset about the crisis. Don't complain. Don't murmur. Look at the crisis and say, glory be to God. This is another opportunity for greatness in my life. Is that opportunity? You know, when you think like God, and when you approach situations like God, and when you understand how God looks at issues in life, in Isaiah 55, he said, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. As far as the heavens are from the earth, that is how my ways are from your ways. When you look at situations in life, challenges, and crisis and problems and issues that transcend natural human reasoning and you look at it and the first thing that comes out of your mouth is wow what glory what grace available for me for when I'm done with this I will glorify God my name will be written in gold I will triumph over this and I have much more reward than I ever envisaged. Now, crisis itself, if it has a mind of its own, we want to flee from you because it is not used to that. I once watched a documentary on Geographical Channel, and this cheetah animal, they used to chasing their prey. They used to pursue the prey, and they expect the prey to run. And this cheetah, this animal, two of them, they were locking horns. I think they were gazelles or so. They were quarreling, they were fighting, and they didn't notice the cheetah came so close to them, and the cheetah came, tried to attack them, and they looked at the cheetah and continued quarreling, and the cheetah was confused, didn't know what to do. Why? The cheetah is used to the prey running, and it chasing the prey. Now, crisis is used to you crying and wowling and whining. It's not used to you saying, glory be to God. It's not used to you facing it and saying, how the matter is going to end. It's not used to you saying, oh glory, I'm going to overcome this and I'm going to come out like God tried it. It's not used to it. So in its own, if Satan is behind it, you've thrown confusion into the kingdom of darkness. So the first thing you must do is that you must have a mindset that helps you to look at crisis from a different perspective in life. I've always said something in the subject of faith, there are certain mindsets you must have. And if you don't have this mindset, you cannot walk by faith. You can't say anything is impossible in life. If someone tells you, I'm going to walk across the ocean, and I'm going to walk from, uh, uh, across the Atlantic Ocean, and I'm going to jog on the sea and jog to the other side. Don't say it's not possible. Just going to ask him, how do you intend to do it? And that's what Mary did when the angel said to her, he said, you will have a son, and his name shall be called Jesus. Mary said, wow. Um, she didn't say, oh, that's not possible. She said, wow, um, I don't have a husband. There's no man right now. How do you intend to do that? Then the angel said, the Holy Ghost will come upon you. Now God is using a means that's never been used before. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. And I understood why God could use Mary. She had a mindset that aligned with the mindset of God. She didn't say, you saw what Zachariah said when they appeared to him and said, oh, you have a son, 
and he shall be called John. He said, what? I'm old. That's not possible. And the Lord got angry. I said, oh, Zachariah, for saying that you will be dumb until my word comes to pass in your life. So the first mindset you must have in dealing with these situations in life is that you must have a mindset of possibility. There is nothing impossible in this life. There is nothing you set your mind in Genesis 11. God said men have become one and there is nothing they set their mind to do that shall be restrained from them. Let us go down now and confuse the language and stop this building. What did they say they were going to do? They said, we'll build a building. We'll build a tower that the highest will enter into heaven. Naturally, even now, you can't build a tower that will enter into space. How are you going to do it? The highest building we had at one time was the World Trade, uh, highest was the World Trade Center. It didn't enter heaven. It's just in the sky. And these people say, we'll build a tower that will enter heaven. Even if that heaven is space, it's still something. God said, they will do it if they set their mind to do it. So you must believe that there, every crisis before you is going to end. And it's going to end with you being glorified. Don't ever say anything is impossible in this life. All things are possible to him that believeth it. You must have that in your subconscious. You must walk with that mindset. And you must live with that mindset on a day-to-day basis. Amen. That's number one. Number two, you will approach the crisis the same way God approached his own crisis. You mean God had a crisis? Oh, yes. He had a crisis where? In heaven. In heaven, he had a crisis. He threw Satan out. The crisis came from heaven, got to the earth, and continued. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved over the face of the waters. Obviously, God will never create anything in this life that will be chaotic, that will be void, and will be dark. Never. God is light. In him is no darkness. Neither variableness nor shadow of turning. Obviously, something went wrong. And we all know it was Satan that destroyed the earth. God came down and looked at the earth and saw what he didn't like at all. Many of you are looking at your life. You look at your finances. You don't like what you're seeing. You look at your home. You don't like what you're seeing. You look at your spouse. You don't like what you're seeing. You look at your children. You don't like what you're seeing. You look at your career. You don't like what you are seeing. God saw the earth. He did not like what he saw. But what did God do? God did not deny what he saw. God did not behave like an ostrich and pretended that the earth was good. God saw what he did not like. God did not say what he saw. God said what he wanted. Remember, God saw what he did not like. God did not deny what he saw. God did not say what he saw. God said what he wanted. And he said, let there be light. I've been listening to some posts on Facebook recently, and what I see shocks me. I hear people say, oh, the 5G technology is here, and it's going to kill us all. It's not going to kill us. No technology is going to kill us. We're going to live our days on this earth. We will live out our time on this earth. We will live it well, and we will live it for God. And we'll live till a ripe old age. And in our, light, light, uh, in our old age, we'll be fruitful. We'll be fresh and flourishing. We'll see our children and our children's children. And they'll prosper and flourish and they'll walk with God. In our old age, we'll die the death of the righteous. We'll bless our children. We'll bless our grandchildren. And like Jesus, we'll say it is fulfilled. Like Paul, we'll say we have fought a good fight. We have kept the faith. We have finished our race. Then like Simeon will say to God, let thy servant depart in peace, for my eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. Not that 5G technology is going to kill us. No, that's not what we should be saying. Not that coronavirus is going to kill us. No, that's not what we should be saying. We're not denying that there's no coronavirus. God didn't deny that there there was darkness everywhere. God didn't acknowledge it either. 
The Bible says in Romans 4, Abraham did not consider the deadness of his body, neither did he deny the deadness of his body, but he called into existence what he wanted. Let us begin to call into existence what we want. Let's stop saying what we are seeing that we don't like. They are dying, oh hey. These governments, they don't know. They don't know what they're doing until Nigerians die, finish. No, that's not what we should be saying. Nigerians will not die, finish. Nigerians will not die on the streets. We will leave. Coronavirus will go. It will be defeated. Now, that doesn't mean we should not observe the medical regulations given to us. That doesn't mean we should not observe the social regulations given to us. We'll observe it, the washing of hands, the hygiene, the social distances, but we're not gonna die. G, 5G, 6G, or oh, you see 5G, then you'll be shocked. 7G will come one day, it's not gonna stop. When it comes, it will not kill us. Radiation will not kill us from 7G. Radiation will not kill us from our bulbs. The sun emits radiation, it's not gonna kill us. It blesses us. Microwave emits radiation. It's not going to kill us. It blesses us. Our TV sets emit radiation. It's not going to kill us. It blesses us. Even these messages, you listen to it on TV, it's blessing you. And it's emitting radiation. Radiation right here, left, center. But it's not going to kill us. I believe you have been blessed by that message. And I know your faith has been built up. And I know all those challenges in life are all going to fall before you in the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to know Hebrews 12 says, Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. You need him in this walk. And so if you're out there and you don't have Jesus in your life, I want you to say after me, say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the only begotten Son of God. Come into my life, be my Lord and my Savior. It's as simple as that. Displayed on the screen is diverse information or how you can interact and reach out to us. Take advantage of it, and I'll be expecting to hear from you. Till I come your way again, same time next week, I want to tell you, don't give up. Faith works. It's working, and it will work in your life. God bless you.